So I'll open it with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for allowing us to come together uh, to study your word, Lord, as we close out Acts uh, with only two chapters left. We would ask for us to have point out lessons that are important to us uh, that you know that we need to know. And I thank you for this in the name of your son. Amen. So uh, we are literally coming to the end of Acts. This is Acts number Acts chapter 27, and then there's 28. It's the final void, voyage of Paul until he spends his two years, his last two years of his life in Rome. This 27 is all about the journey. Well, the trials of the journey. So we're going to start off like we always do, reading Acts 27. And I would like for everyone just to take a, a turn at that at reading a, a a page. It's not a real long uh, chapter. Um, read time's only like six minutes. So I will read the first one and then uh, we can just go on through. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Adramiathium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to the sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. There, the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Snidus. And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salomone. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lacea. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they would reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete. Facing both southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. Now, when the south wind began blowing gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land, and when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and we were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Cotta, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I, and whom I worship. 
And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that I will be exactly as I have been, that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. And when the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. And a little further on, they took a sounding and again, again, and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and pray for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense and without food and having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish on the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now, when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach which they planned it, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, in the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable. And the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Okay, so that's our chapter, and really is about this final journey of Paul on his way to Rome. Uh, it's interesting. I don't know if any of you have ever sailed or been in a storm or even on a body of water where a storm comes up quickly. Uh, I uh, was out with my mom and my brothers, uh, uh, my sister. We were at Spirit Lake and Spirit Lake uh, was is a, just a freshwater lake just uh, uh, that lays up against Mount St. Helens. And we were out on that water. It was a beautiful blue day. We had four canoes. There was two of us to canoe. And it was beautiful, calm water. We were paddling around. And all of a sudden, this storm came up over the mountain and hit that lake. And we had four and a half foot waves. And you know what fear is. You know why you're running for shore to try and get to shore. Even if you have to walk around the lake, it's safer than going across that lake because it's going uh blowing so hard and that's the situation that these guys find themselves in and it's interesting because here if we look at this uh, picture this map it shows how the wind was pushing from the opposite direction and these ships at this time were were not really a good ship that you could tack against the wind they weren't designed for it they were a single sail vessel so they really weren't set up with it they had a rudder and, and it, it talked about that and you can see the journey here Paul takes all the way up uh, as we go through. And we'll look at that a little further along. The centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. He was a centurion that we don't know much about. And we don't know much about this regiment. Uh, it was a uh, several people held this title. Uh, it was simply a group 
uh, uh, this regiment was a group that was there to transport criminals to trial, right? And they would use whatever transportation they could get. Now, if you remember, it talked about the ship and the individual. The ship that they first took was a smaller vessel that they took up, and they were accompanied by Aristakos, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. And if you remember, it said it, it set us. So Luke was obviously with him because Luke was writing this. And this really was a favor from the centurion because he was being transported to court. Normally, when you're going to court, you do not allow anybody else to go with you. Think about a modern thing today. If they're taking a person from a jail, which is what they were taking Paul to the court, they don't get to have friends with them for obvious reasons, right? And he did treat, uh, Julius really did treat Paul very kindly uh, in that when they got to Sidon, he was allowed to be with his friends. And, and he was allowed to leave the ship and go and stay with him until they got ready to leave. Now, the 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 in Acts it talks about the fact that it was a grain ship, and a grain ship is typically a hundred and forty feet long by about seventy uh, thirty six feet wide. That's a pretty small vessel. If you've been on the ocean, that's really quite small. Now there is a little question about this because they did change to a bigger ship but they were still hauling grain and it's interesting because we're going to look at the number of people that came in but it says such since such much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over Paul advised him saying what is what is the statement of the fast is already over me when what when they say that it, we're talking specifically about Yom Kippur. It is the fast of the year. And that's what Paul was talking about. And he advised them, of course, not to go because the time of the season. In the Mediterranean, sailing from September until late November, it is very, very dangerous. The winter is on, the wind, they have people, I mean, we we see that today in the refugees trying to escape. Uh, they they find them all the time. Um, they're getting killed because the boats are overloaded, uh, even to this day when people are trying to get away. So Paul said, sir, I perceive the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Now, this is a typical grain vessel of the Roman Empire. But look at the size of this. This thing's tiny. I mean, how are you going to get the huge number of people on it? And so they had to have been transported on a much larger vessel than just a standard grain vessel. Um, and it's interesting. He warned them, Paul warned them not to go. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and the owner of the ship than to Paul. Why would he do that? Well, a pilot in on the Columbia River, they have river pilots. That pilot is expected to know every single inch of the journey. And they put the, the ship that's coming up the Columbia River into the river pilot's hands. He is the only person responsible for getting that ship there. And he paid attention to the pilot and the owner. So guess what? The owner has product on board. And he needs to be transported. Not only is he at shipping grain, he's shipping prisoners. So Rome is paying him to get these prisoners to Rome. And, of course, the grain is his secondary or, or possibly even his primary way of making a profit on this boat. But the harbor they were in wasn't suitable to spend the winter. What it was, the city that they were in was so small. It couldn't handle having another 276 people in it. 
There likely wouldn't be enough food for the winter. There likely wouldn't be accommodations. They'd have to spend them on the boat in the winter, which anybody that's been on a boat in the winter is not a fun time. Uh, not only the rocking of it, but the weather, the exposure to the weather. And so they put out to sea. They thought perhaps they could reach Phoenix, a bigger boat. And that was my question. Why would they put out? Well, there just were no, no accommodations available for the individuals. And they didn't want to spend two months on a boat sitting there. Now, the south wind blew gently, supposing they... supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor. So here comes this south wind up. And when you think about the Mediterranean, they're coming up and and they're getting ready to go along Crete. The wind is blowing exactly the way they want. It's blowing them north and they get a chance to go right towards Rome. But the problem was that a tempest wind called a nor'easter struck down from the land. So it flipped direction and went the opposite direction. And then the ship was caught and could not face the wind. In other words, there was such a force coming at them, they were they gave way to it. And if we look here on the map, you can see Fairhaven. And, and as they're trying to work their way, they're running right into that wind. And they have absolutely no chance to go where they want to, which is Rome. So they secured a ship's boat. What is a ship's boat? Well, the when you have a grain vessel, uh, a lot of times they didn't have de uh, uh, docks at that time period to offload uh, uh, cargo. So they had a boat, a smaller boat, that they would use to go back and forth between the boat and the landing where they're selling the goods. Uh, run it up on the shore, then pull it back off and go back and make another trip until they got everybody off the boat. So in order to keep from losing it, because typically they would just tow it along behind them. It's a small boat holding 10 to 20 people. They would they lifted it up and hoisted it up so they could run. They used supports to undergird the ship. One thing you have to think about is the fact in the Mediterranean, these boats, and they found them, uh, on diving expeditions, I know they just found one recently. Um, they're they're made completely of wood, and typically they're either spiked together or they're using wood dowels, that type of stuff. But the ship is not designed to take undue stress; it's designed to sail. So what they would do is they would take cables down and under the vessel and back up. So think about a a, a oak barrel. They're putting bindings underneath the ship to hold the ship together so it doesn't come apart in the storm. They were afraid they were going to run aground. One of the things that people think that uh, when sailors sail along a coastline, they get up close to the coastline. They, they That is absolutely false. The deeper water is safer because if you run aground, the chance is very high you're going to destroy your vessel. So they run in deeper water. Um, they lowered gear. Basically, what they did is they lowered a drag gear that would slow the vessel and allow them to guide the vessel, whether it turn left or turn right. Because remember, they're running a single sail. They can turn it to lessen the load on it. They can raise it and lower it. But they really, and, and they do have a rudder in the back. But by adding additional uh, gear, they could slow it. And here they began to jettison cargo. Obviously, they were carrying more than just grain and prisoners. So there was other food, uh, other items on board, merchandise, that they began to throw over the side to try and lighten the vessel. The other thing they may have had as well, uh, a lot of times these boats in the bottom were filled with rock to give them, to weigh them and down. They may have been jettisoning some of that as well. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard. Now, every ship that sails has extra gear because masts break, uh, tackle gets torn up, ropes get frayed. They started throwing everything overboard. And they'd given up hope of being saved. 
on the three, third day. They were already uh, having issues. They had been without food for a long time. And they went without food, remember, 14 days. Now, I've, I've fasted for 14 days. Uh, after a while, you don't need it, but you start losing strength. And doing, they were doing strenuous exercise trying to keep that vessel sinking. And personally, Paul's statement here, men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. I don't know if that was the best timing to say, I told you so, right? You're this best vessel. They all think they're going to die. And Paul's telling them, I told you so. Well, he also, after he made that statement, he encouraged him. He says, yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I worship. Paul here is making a very strong statement about his beliefs. Not only does he believe in a God and worship a God, he is stating that he belongs to God and that an angel appeared before him that very night and told him that. And the angel said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and behold, God has granted you all those that sail with you. So here he's being told and telling these people, look, we will be saved as long as you stay here. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they set down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. So this is a typical Roman anchor of that time period. You notice it not only has the typical anchor shape at the bottom with the two, it's got a crossbar. Why they have that is so that it will drag. Because you got to remember, the Mediterranean is mostly, not always, mostly sand. So you need to have something to drag in the ground. They put four anchors down to try and slow the boat down because they're going so fast. And then as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. So here Paul also had some type of inside knowledge. How would he know they weren't just laying out the anchors? How did he know that they weren't going to take that small ship and try to sail away and stay alive? Because the bigger ship was obviously probably starting to come apart. It was having foundering, what they call it. It was having difficulty staying, keeping the water out of it. And he knew, he had been told that these people need to stay on board. Paul urged all the men to take some food. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been seasick, but I have. The last time, last thing you want to do is eat food. You just don't want to eat food because you don't want to come it back up. And But they had been without food for 14 days. And today is the 14th day that you have continued to suspend and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food. It will give you strength for not a hair on your hair not a hair is to perish from the, the head of any of you. So he really is uh, encouraging them. And he says, and this is an interesting says, and when he had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. So here, not only is Paul saying he believes in God and that he belongs to God, he is taking the food, breaking the bread, and thanking God as a witness to all of these people. There were 276 people in all in the ship, right? Well, you remember that first picture we showed? It had this small ship that maybe would hold 20. This is the size of vessel it would have taken to hold 276 vessels. And this happens to be a Roman uh, war ship. So having 276 people is a lot. The question is how many of them were prisoners? How many of them were, uh, I mean, obviously the centurion had to bring a guard with him. Uh, 
They and the, the ship also had grain on it and other products to sell. Do you think? So, do you huh? think? It, do you think it might have been overloaded and that is uh, with people as well, and that is why they were having some trouble. Well, it could have been overloaded. It doesn't say that, but it couldn't have been a small ship anyway to put that many people on board. I mean, I you've all seen what how many 200, 300 people is. It would take a very a ship that's only 140 feet by 36 feet. It, you couldn't even get people standing on board and making it. You that had to have been a much larger vessel uh, than was typical. Uh, but this is probably an owner who's got a lot of money. So there were set 276 vessels and people in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out all the wheat into the sea. So now they've already thrown the product and the, the other items in the sea. They've thrown all the tackle into the sea. They've thrown all the grain. The only thing left is soldiers, is the, the soldiers. And the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, least anyone should swim away and escape. Why was that their plan? Well, because in a Roman uh, uh, city, the, the Romans ruled that if you allowed a prisoner to escape, you were put to death. You remember when uh, they rolled away the stone and the and and the soldiers were told, "Oh no, don't don't say that," because they would have been killed for allowing failing duty. That is what they did. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. Now, Paul was a prisoner. But was he a convicted felon? No, he was not. The rest of these people were already convicted, probably going to Rome to either face execution or be used in the games. That was a big deal for prisoners. They got put into uh, uh, the Colosseum. But Paul really did want them, uh, had testified that they were going to be saved. The centurion obviously liked Paul. He had let him stay with his friends. and. So he kept them from carrying out their plan. And then everyone was able to make it safely to land. They got a piece of wood. They got a, whatever they could hang on to, and they swam to shore, those that could swim. Remember, swimming was not just like today. Not everybody can swim. But they were all able to swim. Now, next week, we're going to conclude Acts 28 with the remainder of Paul's journey and then his time, his last two years in Rome. And that's where Acts ends. So does anybody have any questions about our study tonight? I know it was only 30 minutes, but uh, it, it is important because it shows Paul's faith. It, it, it shows the fact that the centurion believed in Paul, right? Paul, he didn't have to believe that Paul said, you're going to be saved. He could have had him killed. That way he doesn't get executed. So this chapter here really does talk about having faith in God, no matter how bad it gets. And, and that's the whole purpose of this chapter of Acts. So next week, Gordon is going to finish it up and, and go back and tie everything together for the whole book of Acts. Let's end with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for allowing us to be here tonight, allowing us to study uh, your word and see how that even when things don't go our way uh, and even if we ignore your advice you still have your hand over us and I want to thank you for that Lord as we continue through this week uh, please always keep your hand over us and allow us to grow in faith of you and I thank you in the name of your son Yeshua amen